Hashtag representation matters is one of those easy to will bumper sticker type slogans that has reached mass acceptance. And this is precisely why I believe that we as black people should be critical of it. Remember, the black is necessary because we and everything we create and make possible are able to be accumulated and transacted into money, power, and civil, social, moral, and existential cohesion. Always for others. This means that both negrophobia and negrophilia are able to be turned into gain for everyone else. But to us, always registers as more loss. I feel like in this video, we're going to begin thinking about some heavy and heady concepts. So before we hop headlong into that, I want to remind you to subscribe and hit the notification button so that you know whenever we drop new content. This helps the channel out a great deal. Also, don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram where we can continue these conversations. This way we can learn about some of the concepts and jargon we use, scholars mentioned, and explore Black imaginative production together. And lastly, if you so choose, support our Patreon. Our goal is to garner virtual, but also actual space for continued group study and imaginative community building. You may have noticed how YouTube videos, ads, mainstream television, corporate and personal brands benefit from both the antagonization of Black people and the seeming acceptance of Black culture through the appropriation and expropriation of Black music, fashion, features, and more. So for me, Anytime something that seems to be a black need or want sits comfortably within the mainstream, I feel we should question it. In an anti-black world, nothing black should retain or maintain the world. Representation is such a thing. The idea of representation, as far as I can tell, comes into a kind of political consciousness during the early years of the English colonial project. Representation in the sense of the American political consciousness is supposed to encourage political and civic participation through a system of rewards. Those people who participate through, let's say, voting are rewarded by having their needs advocated for and met by those who represent them. Not only does this encourage the idea of civic duty and participation, but it makes one a political being able to wield their will toward the shaping of a landscape of power. For these political beings, will can be realized in a conclusion. Will moves toward an end, and thus representation is a means to an end. Black people can boast no such being, no such standing. Our ability to have our needs and wants met, our participation is a means with no end. And the hope that we put into representation is what Lauren Berlance would call cruel optimism. Dr. Grant Fard suggests that Black voting, the will to be represented, is not motivated by politics. If it were, Black people would have to contend with the irrationality of wanting to be represented. And it would probably move most of us to stop voting, as it has me. Black people are motivated by history. Most often, we vote out of an obligation to those who marched, bled, died, and struggled for the right to vote. Not from any efficacy or interventions we've gotten by partaking in the process. Too often, what we are contending with is a sense of shame derived with letting our forebears down. Colin Kaepernick took a knee in 2016. Since then, Micaiah Bryant, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and hundreds of more of us across the U.S. alone have been killed. To give you an even better example, after a particularly shocking act of violence against the Asian community, Congress very quickly moved to put legislation in place outlawing anti-Asian hate crimes. What's more, the conversation after the incident in Atlanta where a white gunman left eight people dead, six of them Asian women, the anti-Asian conversation somehow still implicated Black people as the primary perpetrators of anti-Asian hate and violence, which means that the Asian political will will probably be wielded in anti-Black ways. To compare, the Emmett Till anti-lynching law 
took years to pass, and it still does not specifically implicate anti-Black racism in the definition of lynching. Here in South Carolina, lynching is defined as mob violence, something that Black teenagers who fight here are often accused of. So an act with a particularly Black history will still probably be able to be wielded in anti-Black ways. Barack Obama was not able to intervene on this. Cory Booker is not able to intervene on this. The Congressional Black Caucus can't either. What's interesting is that in the news stories regarding the anti-Asian hate crime legislation, Kamala Harris is considered the first Asian American vice president. Asians who look at her as representation get a political end. But the half-black Howard University grad and AKA doesn't represent anything more than yet another ineffective icon at best and an outright antagonist at worst for black people. So what does this have to do with media? On the one hand, it should call us to question our relationship to media. And on the other, it gives rise to questions about the nature of representation itself. I guess we should start with what representation exposes about our own desires. Or maybe it's best to say that representation exposes that we have anti-Black desires for incorporation and relationality. Sometimes even I have to admit that it would be easier to have the world in all of its anti-life and anti-Black ways work for me than to figure out what the hell it means to destroy it. The thing about desire is that it seeks to reproduce itself. It never actually wants to be fulfilled or satiated. Or it might be more accurate to say that we don't want desire to come to an end because it is what makes us think that there are things, activities, and people that we can engage that will push us to some unknown heights or blissful and pleasurable experience and living. And because desire doesn't want to come to an end, we are driven to replicate or at least allow that which provides the possibilities and context for these very desires. So representation acts as fantasy, the narrative form of our desires. The stories we create that make the fulfillment of our desires seem possible while never truly ever getting us to that fulfillment. Okay, so let's say this another way. Representation is how we come to understand that monarchies are abusive and that they have been particularly brutal to Africa and its diaspora, but we still hold out possibility and have want for Disney princesses who are black. We go up for Meghan Markle and we have a slew of black men who are wondering when we will have a black prince or king story. So then representation can actively entice us to work against what we know to be the truth, hoping for some kind of possibility that will exempt us from what we know. This is the thing. I'm not saying that black people shouldn't be seen. I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't be in movies or shows. I'm not saying that we should give up on media and various kinds of art. I just think that we owe it to ourselves to ask important questions of hell, everything. And representation doesn't get a pass. It's not sacred such that it can or should go uncriticized. In being represented, I think we should always be asking ourselves what we are being represented as, what we are being represented in, and to what end does representation move us? One of the ways that I see representation used is to suggest that there are Black people who aren't like other Black folk. This is the Black excellence narrative that tries to divvy up Blackness into kinds that are then put into hierarchies in anti-Black and colonialist practice that stratifies the worthiness of certain existences. The argument is usually that Black people can be lawyers, record label execs, doctors, dentists, and the like, and that this is preferable to blue collar workers, sex workers, domestics, drug dealers, thieves, and the unemployed. Something that I'm not sure we're aware of, however, is that in doing this, we are trying to answer racist questions about our ability to acquire certain markers of validity and legitimacy. In this way, we admit that we are not our own standard. This doesn't challenge anti-Blackness, which already places legitimacy and validation in the hands of others. It reinscribes it. The logic relies on already tested methods of appealing to visibility. But the hyper-visibility of 
kinds of Blacks has only ever served as food for fantasy and perverse imaginations and has thus rendered Black personhood invisible. Or maybe instead of being rendered invisible, representation as visibility renders us opaque. The veneer of narration, the stories created to assert our value, make truly seeing us an impossibility. Perhaps one of the most insidious effects of being seen on TV or in movies is that it allows us to conflate being and existing. While the ability for the Black to be is contested, we do exist. This is perhaps one of the most critical interventions that Frantz Fanon established. The Black does not exist with. The Black is reduced to a tool that exists for. We exist to be wielded by others that have the capacity to become men, women, trans, cis, civilized, citizens, political and relational beings. In my video on anti-Black violence, I discuss how the Black exists as inherently viable and how this violation makes communities of differentiated people possible by making the Black the entity of irreconcilable difference. In that video, I also talk about the violence of being identified in Western terms, but it is through representation that we assert very loudly that Black gays exist, Black trans people exist, Black successful people exist. What we take as a plea for recognition of our being is just a statement of what is true. Black people exist, but that's it. Do I get that seeing certain realities on TV saves lives? I do. Do I understand that certain images preserve dignity? I do. But this leads me to the last question. To what end? Are we preserving life just so that we can be fodder for anti-Black machinery longer? What of the very idea that dignity can be achieved for Black people in this world is keeping us from rejecting this world and opting for freedom instead? An existence where dignity never comes into conversation because there is no shame attached to our being and we aren't marked for degradation and humiliation. What if representation is always tied to this world and therefore cannot escape or imagine us without or out of this world? And what if we are driven to think of representation positively for this reason? To kill freedom dreams. What would be possible to depict if we didn't have to worry about being represented or how we're represented? I can't wait to hear your thoughts and I'm genuinely looking forward to hearing about the conversations you're going to have. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and tap the bell to get notifications. Also, make sure to share these videos with your community and see what those around you have to say.